Alright, hey guys, so today we are going to be reviewing what, in my opinion, is truly a one in a kind opening book E3 Poison. And this book was written by Grandmaster Axel Smith, a Grandmaster from Sweden, who also wrote the book Pump Up Your Reading, a very well known book about trying to improve your chest. But basically, in 2017, when this book was first released, or even a bit before that, you know, when you were like planning on the book concept and whatnot, Axel wanted to do something similar for the opening stage of the game, giving players a repertoire which, unlike many other opening books, isn't based around just, you know, like trying to memorize this huge like opening tree of like lines, you know, how if you've ever gone through one of them, you, you get to like variation like A3, B2, C, whatever, right? It's like eventually you just get so lost in what you're doing that you lose interest and stop reading, or you're an absolute crackhead like me and you go through the whole thing anyway. In either case though, Axel basically didn't feel that these sorts of, you know, typical repertoires were really optimal for most people in terms of, you know, really learning, you know, an opening. So in E3 Poison, what Axel Smith was really trying to do, he wasn't necessarily trying to show you like in every single line we're going to be gaining at least a slight advantage we're going to be absolutely blowing our opponents off the board but rather what we are going to be doing is we are going to be gaining interesting positions which we will supposedly have a quote-unquote academic advantage into use once again the author's words where basically this so-called academic advantage what it comprises of is mainly two things one the first one being that our opponents very often aren't going to be too familiar with the lines presented in the book so already from that perspective, we're just more familiar with the lines than our opponents as opposed to like, I don't know, let's say we play 1d4 and our opponents play the semi-slav, so we get these moves on the board, we decide to play a main line as I used to do, and we play bishop g5, our opponent plays botvinnik variation, and they've studied like 20 moves of maybe even like 30, 40 moves of theory going deep into the weeds of these lines, where if you're not constantly on top of things and you forget one move, all of a sudden that could be a very bad game for you and you could really lose without ever really having even given a fight in the game. Or you remember everything but so does your opponent so all you get is a draw. And the second part to the academic advantage is really that we're going to be quite comfortable in the horizon structures we get because if we, you know, play the repertoire in enough games, eventually we'll get a feel for the structures. Also, I mean, just studying the lines in the book, of course, will give you to some extent a feel for them. And as much as, you know, it is kind of a cliche, people, like if you just know the structure, that matters so much more than memorizing. It's like, I mean, if you really get into that sort of situation like I have before where it's like you memorize all the theory, but then you get like, I don't know, a Past point five position, but you just don't really understand what's going on in the position very often because you don't understand the pawn structure of the position. Then it's sort of like, well, what was all that for? And the answer is maybe not much. But what we were just talking about, who is this book really for? Because to some players, like, you know, they'll hear all that stuff, it sounds good in theory, but maybe it's just not really relevant to them. Like, if you're not, I'd say, at least 1800, 1900, this book won't really be for you, I think. And when I say that, 1800, 1900, I'm referring to over the board ratings. The reason being that, like, this repertoire, I should also say, it's not just like a 1d4 repertoire, it's also a knight of 3 repertoire, it's also a 1c4 repertoire, and I should get the move on the board, and it's also a 1e3 repertoire, yes, 1e3 as well. Hence the name, of course, like E3 Poison. And one thing I want to make clear is that the author presents all these moves in the book, gives some analysis of some of the unique options within each of them, but largely the concept of this book is to use these moves interchangeably depending on who your opponent is. And you know, if like someone in your area you know plays a certain opening, the author discusses like which move orders the best against which openings, etc, etc. While you also have the benefits of because you can sort of weave in between these different first moves, it allows you to potentially avoid some you know, very direct preparation in certain lines of your repertoire. Of course, if you're like 1300, 1400, does that matter? No, it really doesn't, to be honest. And also, like all these different move orders, it's really going to confuse you more than like anything else, I think, which is another reason that's like, 
I, I would not recommend, especially if this is like your first serious opening repertoire, even if you're a bit higher rated, like 1700, 1800 maybe, it's like, by the way, I first didn't really start studying openings until I was already like 1800 maybe, if I tried to make this my first repertoire, it would have been an absolute shit show. So basically what the author recommends and I recommend is like, if you're say below that level, or like you're maybe even at that level, but you haven't ever seriously done work on openings before, well first you should actually study some main lines like D4, C4, a lot of the stuff that the author for says in relation to E3 Poison is only really going to be valid if you're playing people who actually, you know, study openings and it's difficult to really get an advantage against them and whatnot, or at the very least, you know, going for something like D4, uh, sorry, maybe let's say Knight of Three, D5, and emitting D4 immediately and being tricky for the move orders. If you're playing a 1200, these moves could all be the same to them because they haven't even studied, like, the main lines in the Queen's Gambit with D5, D4, sorry, d4, d5, c4, so it's like trying to be tricky for the move orders, it, it doesn't really make any sense, right? Whereas if you're 1800 and people have studied this, maybe, maybe there's some benefit to, you know, trying to take them out of their comfort zone and going for a move order like this. Also, rating aside, I should mention, because, you know, I first read this book back all the way in 2017 when I was like 14 years old, I was maybe 1900, 2000, can't quite remember. I read the book, I played some of the lines a bit online, I, I got the general gist of the repertoire, but honestly, it just turned me off whenever the author was sort of, you know, very honest, and he was like, okay, in this position, we're equal, so what? That's sort of how chess is. I'm like, what? No, I want to get an advantage. And so I basically dropped the repertoire before ever seriously played in any actual tournament games or whatever, because I was the type of player, as the author actually self-admittedly was before himself, the type of player who always wants to get an advantage out of the opening, they have all this very concrete preparation, they come to the board and blitz out like 20 moves of fury. Like, there's nothing inherently wrong with that. In fact, if that's sort of your mentality right now, I'm not necessarily going to discourage you from going through that, because like, you know, I had that sort of quote-unquote phase myself where... I would try to play all these super theoretical openings and force an advantage onto the position. But then eventually I sort of reached the point, like maybe where I am now, where I realized maybe that's not necessarily all it's cracked up to be. And I can see greater appeal in going for a system like this, where it's like, you know, is it the most, you know, direct, confrontational, ambitious way to play the opening? No, definitely not. But that does not mean that there's not necessarily practical benefit in plain sort of systems like these. And a lot of the times people hear practical and you know, it sort of goes in through one ear and like out the other. It really takes time and experience to really internalize what that truly means, I think. Which is again, it's like why I wouldn't really recommend this to someone who's like, you know, this is their first like serious opening repertoire or something. It doesn't make sense in that case. Basically, I think it's a lot easier to go from something sort of mainstream to something sort of like less mainstream and less theoretical than doing it the other way around, which is, you know, once again, why I'm suggesting what I'm suggesting. But, you know, if you still want to check out the book, I mean, feel free to do so. But uh, yeah, basically the repertoire itself, getting into some things. So of course, we already discussed, it's not just a one D4 repertoire, it's not just a one Knight of Three repertoire, it's just, it's not just a one E3 repertoire, it's not just a one C4 repertoire. It is all of these things combined into a, sort of a holistic system, you could say. For example, one point is like, Let's say for whatever reason you're playing one of these dirty Queen's Gambit accepted players. Well, you could be a little bit tricky and you could play Knight of Three first and then D5, E3, and then C4, and now you've basically avoided the Queen's Gambit accepted because after say Knight of Six, C4, I mean D takes E4, Bishop takes E4, and okay if like after E6 we play D4 and you know transpose, this is now Queen's Gambit accepted, but one really cool thing is that white can omit d4 for as long as we want, and eventually get to a point where when we play d4, we can get a slight but definite improvement over the normal Queen's Gambit accepted. Also in general, I have to say I'm quite a fan of some of the lines like uh, where black also goes c6, we get these anti sloth positions and the anti-Queen's Gambit decline positions. I've always liked these a fair bit. However, what I've always been less of a fan of, say, are the positions after like G6 and where black goes for some of these more like King's Indian type setups. And this was definitely, I can remember, one of the things which uh, turned me off a lot of this whole repertoire back in like, say, 2017 maybe? Where, I mean, the author's recommending to go for these lines where you go E3, and I think back then this really made me cringe just going E3. I was the type of guy who I always wanted to get, you know, knight E3, 
an e4 on the board, I want to occupy the whole center with my pawns. And I mean, undeniably, I, I still think that's definitely the most principled way to play. But e3, it's a bit of, um... It's a bit of a psychological ploy, you could almost say, in a sense. So we're playing in much more of a restrained way, not really taking the whole center for ourselves. And I should also mention that against players who play the Grunfeld, like say if we play knight c3, now d5 is what the Grunfeld player would play. And now, like for example, with the exchange variation is possible, something that you know, of course, every Grunfeld player has studied for hours and hours with Peter Swidler's chessable course, maybe not, but probably right. Whereas if we go e3, now the Grunfeld player is kind of, you know, going to be stuck for what to do because e3, it kind of looks a bit stupid to be honest, but when they play d5 now, if they're a Grunfeld player, right, they're the ones who are kind of stupid because after e4, we have spent two tempi with our e pawn, but, but I can't really take a knight on c3 because our knight is still on b1. Which means that they get this sort of Grunfeld position, except they don't really get to take on c3, and we can just sort of develop our pieces harmoniously. Yes, we've kind of lost a bit of time, but Black also hasn't really gotten what they've wanted because they had to retreat the knight back to b6. And to be honest, these lines I was kind of a bit on board with. I could see the appeal in this, but I was sort of less persuaded by, I guess you could say, with these lines with d6, and when Black sort of plays what is actually a reverse king's indian attack very often for example we might get this via these moves here right where we get what is called a king's indian attack this can also arise via like e4 e6 the french defense but basically white you know gets this sort of on e5 this wedge and they then reroute their pieces around to the king's side where they're gonna do all sorts of attack and stuff that kind of looks a bit scary right but basically the argument of Axel is that when we get this position of white, we have reverse colors and hence white is actually a tempo up on the usual variations. I'm not necessarily convinced the tempo is the biggest deal in the world though. There's also lines where black can like take on d4 instead that are maybe also technically critical I guess you could say. But like these lines where, you know, we get this like... Not opposite side castling, but opposite wing sort of action right where we're trying to you know, go for the queen side attack, Black's trying to go for the king side thing. He definitely needs some very sharp positions, but I was just looking over these lines again this morning, actually. I was really looking at this book in general in the last few days, because I don't know what happened, but I just sort of like, randomly popped into my mind this book. I can't remember how, it just did. I think it was like some lines in the Dutch I was looking at, actually, like, because uh, a lot of these lines are like very main line, where you go for the fiend Kedo. I've never really understood them that well, to be honest. But what I was sort of thinking was, you know, like these Dutch players, they've spent a lot of time really studying these three Kedong lines in depth because this is the main line, right? And when Dutch players play the Dutch, I mean, this is honestly what they want to see, right? So I was like, well, what's something I can do to like sort of take them out of their comfort zone, I guess? And one answer that E3 Poison provided was we can go for <laughs> these E3 lines. And despite it looking, you know, slightly passive, less active than maybe the G3 lines, there definitely is some virtue to this whole just like, you know, playing E3, developing the bishop somewhere, C4, knight C3, castles. Granted, I think the author, he actually recommends develop, sorry, delaying the, the woman of the knight on G1, like against the E6 lines, he wants you to put the knight on E2 instead of F3. And then basically, you know, once I thought of like the whole like e3 lines in the dutch again i sort of that was when this whole like e3 poison book i was like aha that was the that book i and so i opened to the section in dutch and i then like you know sort of reversed my way back to the start of the book and i was like a lot of this a lot of the stuff this guy is saying this axel smith guy it makes sense to me and even though I haven't read the book in like five or six years, I'm like, may maybe I do want to give this stuff a crack again, because honestly, as I said again, like sort of at the start of the video, when I was like talking about who this is for, like at least for me, it's just that time passing, gaining some experience along the way. It really sort of changed what I was sort of looking for. This sounds like I'm talking about like a life partner or some shit, but in an opening, right? Just to sort of elaborate and expand upon the sort of power of the move orders, I want to show... A game of the authors, also this is another sort of critical line in the repertoire I'd say, where the author started by playing one E3 and he sort of described this move as, you know, something that looks very innocuous and it can sort of catch the opponent off and make them a bit overconfident because when you play a very meek move like one E3, it doesn't seem like you have very big ambitions. What this can also do is it can lead your opponent to not really think about how you could actually potentially transpose to more uh, mainline openings, and so Axel's opponent in this game was an international master, he played g6, knight, f3, c5, and after d4, 
bishop g7c4, d5, and the following moves. What actually happens is we transpose into a Benoni structure, albeit similar to the King's Indian, where instead of having the pawn on e4, we have the pawn back on e3, which looks like a bit of a, you know, worse version of the Benoni than we would typically get with the white pieces. However, you know, Axel doing his job, he definitely makes some points for why this position might not necessarily be as bad as it may look at first sight. The, the big one being that very often the Benoni, what black wants to do is they want to have this sort of pawn e4 is actually a target of attack they can latch on to. But with the pawn back on e3, all of a sudden that is sort of missing in a lot of lines. And so basically what white's going to do is they, they could play e4 in a lot of lines, like for example, in this game, Axel actually played e4 immediately, but he also could have, you know, more slowly built up to the point where he proves his pieces a little bit and only then plays e4 when he's comfortable because it's also kind of difficult for black to really do much in the meantime if we sort of restrict there. I mean, of course, they're going to play knight 7, try to go for some sort of queenside uh, pawn play, but if we can sort of restrict that, and also then only when it's convenient for us to play e4, that sort of could be an ideal situation, you could say. But okay, Axel won e4, but basically, I mean, the game itself isn't even that really relevant, but what was really interesting was what Axel said here was that his opponent had never played the Benoni in his life, or at the very least was not a Benoni player, but he had tricked him into, okay, maybe it's a slightly inferior version of the normal Benoni, but just the fact alone that Axel was familiar with these pawn structures I've been saying a million times throughout this video and his opponent wasn't, that's already a huge practical advantage in of itself because Benoni, quite frankly, it's not a very easy structure if you've ever played it to play if you don't really have any experience in the positions especially. And this clearly showed in the next few moves when his opponent was playing sort of naturally for a while but then after knight's four bishop a6, Despite bishop takes c4 sort of being an idea in some positions, it supposedly, at least according to the author, I haven't really checked this myself, but isn't really so good when the knight is on c7 instead of d7, where I think it can jump into e5 and sort of gain counterplay in the dark squares and whatnot. And after all these moves, white had a big advantage, knight 5 was played, g4, kicking the knight back, something that the author, again, hypothesized that maybe his opponent wasn't too familiar with, just blatantly going g4, it's a very typical idea in the Benoni, but I don't know, maybe if you don't play the Benoni, you wouldn't be too familiar with that. And he basically, you know, got a big advantage, went on to grab a pawn, and ultimately within a matter of moves, gained a decisive advantage with some sort of uh, attack on the king's side. So basically some final thoughts, it's been about six years, maybe just under since the book was written, and some people would say like, well, is this repertoire still viable or like the stuff in the book? And I mean, one thing I'd say is that most of the value in this book to begin with doesn't really lie in like the concrete analysis of the lines and whatnot. But rather what a lot of it does lie in is sort of the explanations, the instructive games. There's also quite a bunch of like exercises littered throughout the book, some at the end. Some of the exercises at the end of the book were, were a bit weird. It's like shows you a position it's like, it's asking you to guess whether this is white or black. The author wants you to like reconstruct the moves in your head and whatnot. Some kind of weird stuff to be honest. He apparently he's done it with his students and it helps. I don't know, it felt a bit weird to me. But you know, that aside, in general, a lot of the stuff in the book, the exercises, games, even the analysis, the author, you know, I think really strikes a sweet balance for all that. The analysis, okay, that could be a bit outdated, but I think it's still good nonetheless and because i mean the author wasn't really trying to you know show like any cutting edge stuff necessarily but more so like here are some you know important clear ideas but i think still even in 2023 and maybe even like five ten years or whatever like this book is still going to be a classic and still can be at least the the core philosophy or concept of the repertoire can still be used effectively in practice of course, if you're like at the right level and whatnot, if you're like 1200, please don't read E3 Poison, it's not for you. But uh, yeah, definitely I felt some inspiration reading the book. I might be using some of the ideas in it or at least the sort of philosophy of the repertoire and some of my own games going forward. But uh, yeah, of course, if you like the video, please like it, subscribe, and also check out my free stuff in the description below. I have a free newsletter, but uh, yeah, hope you guys all have a good day and I'll see you until next time.